the 52 Sketches Podcast. Today, episode 11, music producer and music technologist, Kelly Snook. Welcome to 52 Sketches, a podcast about creativity and creative practices. Here's your host, Rob Head. Welcome to the 52 Sketches Podcast. This is your host, Rob Head. We are here today to chat about living a creative life, the art and science of bringing truth and beauty into the world. So today, I welcome rocket scientist turned music producer, Kelly Snook. (laughs) Dr. Kelly Snook earned a PhD in aerospace engineering from Stanford University and worked at NASA for many years as a research scientist. She left NASA to pursue music production and music technology, working with such stellar artists as Imogen Heap and Ariana Grande. She now teaches at the University of Brighton and is the inventor of experimental digital instruments, such as the Mimu gloves that turn gesture into music. So Kelly, I am delighted to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Wonderful. So your background is, shall we say, you know, compared to most of our guests, Unusual. So let's <laughs> let's tell your backstory. Uh, it's pretty clear from your academic uh, achievements that you were a science kid. Yeah. Actually, I was always a music kid. I yeah, I, yeah. But I, when it came time to choose what to do with my life, which they make you really feel like you have to know when you're 16. Mm-hmm. Um, I was terrified to do music. I was so terrified that um, that engineering seemed like the easy way out. So um, <laughs> I chose engineering mm. over music and I always felt that I was, I was uh, in a way um, dodging my duty to my mm. purpose. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I always, um, I always did keep it, tried to keep a, a little hand in music. Um, even when I was in school, wasn't mm. uh, sometimes more successfully than others, but um yeah, really, it was always music that was calling to me. So, did you play certain instruments as a kid? I did. Up? I did played you play a lot band of at school? I did. I did all of that. I played the piano <clears throat> mainly, but mm-hmm. then I also played. I went through a series of different instruments before, in fifth grade, settling on the oboe. I I think I I had a stint oh, nice. with the bassoon. That was too mm-hmm. heavy. With the cello, <laughs> with the violin, uh, with the baritone. Uh, but I mm-hmm. chose, I chose the oboe eventually and the piano was always there, but that was back in the days when I thought those were my choices. Now I didn't know about music production in those days. Right. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Huh. It's fascinating. I grew up in sort of a similar fashion. Um, and I went to the university of Maryland thinking I was going to study aerospace engineering like you did. Uh, it, but did the irresponsible thing and drifted around and got a degree in dance. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> but lucky for me, uh, the, the web came along and I was able to make a living in technology, even though I didn't, you know, nobody had a degree in web technology. So it was, <laughs> it right. was sort of free for all. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that was, that was a good time. Okay. So, so you, you played all these instruments and you, end up going to university for um, engineering. Did music continue to call to you during that time? Or tell us about your your schooling and, and your early career. It really did. I uh, When I was a freshman at the University of Colorado, I, um, I played oboe in the orchestra. Uh, I... I kind of had decided that I was going to do music, uh, air quotes on the side and mm-hmm. air quotes. Um, it, it, it wasn't until I was into my almost finished with my PhD at Stanford that I, I got this overwhelming sense that it wasn't enough for me to do it on the side, but then still thinking I needed to do it on the side I Mm -hmm. I did for a very brief moment about a few months before I handed in my PhD. um, I went and started to look into what it would it would take to get a music degree instead of (laughs) instead of an aerospace (laughs) engineering degree, Um, and that just was too. uh, At that point, it was really too late. So instead, what I did Mm. was I. um, Well, while I was a graduate student, I had also pursued some 
really interesting musical forms. I, for a few years, I was in the Stanford Taiko Ensemble, which is a Japanese mm-hmm. drumming kind of. Yeah, we have a Taiko uh, guy here in in Ashland, Oregon, who's yeah. really masterful. Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually not possible to say whether that's dance or martial art or music. Mm-hmm. It's kind of all mm-hmm. the things together. <laughs> I learned a lot about myself and about it's, the way I think about music. It's the only instrument I've seen where you have to literally train, work out to, <laughs> to play yeah. that instrument. Yeah, and so I did. A lot of my years as, as a graduate student were really focused on taiko and not on aerospace mm. engineering because hmm. the ensemble the ensemble also was very serious and we would do, hmm. it was more than 40 hours a week of, of physical training and we made our own drums and we made our own, uh, our own outfits, <clears throat> performance outfits. And, mm. you know, it was a very, it was a serious practice. It wasn't just... It wasn't just a hobby. So, right, right. Um, you know, that I, I always uh, more and more as I was going going along in my engineering degree, I was trying to I was getting a sense that I wasn't just going to build rockets. I was going to maybe try and figure out how to do more. And mm-hmm. but it wasn't until I had already been working as a civil servant at NASA for a year that I I figured out how to. um buy a buy a proper recording studio and start learning how to produce music so it was you know i I had already finished my phd in the end i decided to just get it because i was so close (laughs) and um and and then and then figure out how to learn uh music production i knew that if i were going to make music the way that i needed to make music um i would need to learn the technology and yeah, actually, the thing that yeah. made me realize that was one night um, I came home really late at night and heard a song of Imogen Heaps on the radio. And and it just jolted me into realizing that I needed to be putting energy into figuring out how to make mm. how to make music. Um, mm. It was yeah. it, it wasn't a good feeling. It was a kind of a panic feeling <laughs> that was actually yeah. what caused me to look into well, what, what would what would it take for me to get a music degree but the, the degree was not the answer really it was just putting in the time and the technology right the skills yeah i've had a couple of moments of like where you're just completely arrested by a particular artist i i remember i had to pull the car over when i heard tori amos for the first time yeah sam and, similar with tori and that around the same time she was also making music uh, yeah, she, mm-hmm. she was putting music. I was late '90s, you know, and a, yeah. st- music was starting to come out. That was like, oh, this is this is, sounds like what's in me. Somebody else is mm. making my music. <laughs> my in music, a way, yeah. it felt like that. Like, oh gosh, what am I doing? Why am I not? Uh, why am I not doing this? Right. Uh, so, so it sounds like there's sort of a, a a sense of something calling to you, even though you're you're doing you're living a life that that most people would find, you know, at the sort of peak of our society, you've done the right thing. You've gotten all the <clears> degrees, <throat> you're working at NASA, you could, like couldn't be, you know, more responsible and more uh, contributing to society in the, in the way that we normally frame that. <laughs> and yet it sounds like something. Yeah. So w- would you describe it as a calling or, or I mean, like how? Yeah, very much so. But it was one that I was trying very hard to ignore in terms of mm. a profession. Because, you know, and part of it was a response to the completely inappropriate way that society handles art and music. And, you know, I wanted very, very much to be creative and for my life to be about music, but I didn't want it to be about me. And it was, mm. it's really impossible to separate those, those things in the traditional music industry. Music industry mm-hmm. is about glorifying individuals and yes yeah and people and their image and their bodies and and it's so materialistic that i couldn't see a pathway for uh, for mm-hmm. leading a life that was supported by a profession in music without succumbing to what i saw as just a completely inappropriate music industry Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and I couldn't reconcile those things, so it was very much uh, this calling that I needed to ignore, mm-hmm. or or do on the side, or so. like it was very confusing for me until a pretty 
specific moment a few years later that I had, I started to have a, an inkling of what it really looked like, what the calling really was. It definitely mm. isn't being a rock star or being a concert pianist <laughs> or those things right. that I, that's really all I knew when I was a child. You know, I, if I were going to go into music, it's either like being a performer or being a recording artist or being a, uh, you know, I don't mm. know, being some front and center stage in a performance uh, situation. Right. Or, right. or playing in an orchestra, an ensemble or something. Uh, you yeah. know, those were those to me, that was what it meant if I were going to do music. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned um, Imogen Heap. And, and the first time I heard of you actually was from, I think, a mutual friend that lives in Palo Alto. Uh, and they mentioned that it, maybe it was Imogen Heap that lured you away finally from NASA. Is that it right? was. Yeah, it Tell was. us that story. Yeah. How did you make that transition? Yeah. So, um, you know, as I had explained, Imogen, Imogen's music had a really big impact on me in that critical time when I was doing my PhD. It was her first, it was her first album, really. I don't really actually listen to music very much, but I'd listened to that pretty, pretty obsessively. And then kind of got busy doing other things for many years. And I started producing music uh, on my own and, um, and while I was working at NASA. And so we could just cut a few to eight years later. And by this time, I'm in Washington, D.C. My studio's there. I've been, I've been producing music for a few years with independent artists. And um, I Were was you working watching, at Goddard Space Flight Center? At I the was. Time, I was working yeah. at headquarters and at Goddard, both, hmm. uh, when hmm. I was living in D.C. And, I see. And I, I was just watching a movie, and the end of it was Let Go, the, the song Let Go that Imogen did with Guy Sigsworth in, in their duo called Fru Fru. And yeah. I was just jolted back into, oh, my gosh, Imogen Heap is still making music. Of course she is. And, wow, <laughs> this is incredible. And then I realized, because I had been producing music for so long, that what I loved about, one of the things I loved about Imogen's music was her production and also Guy's production, Guy Sigsworth's mm. production. Mm -hmm. And now that I'd been producing, I was listening to music in a completely new way. And I got in mm -hmm. touch with Guy Sigsworth um, at that moment just to tell him how much I love his production and to, mm. um, I don't know, just to, yeah, just to let him know. And he wrote right back because he was he was really a NASA, a NASA nerd as well. And so he mm -hmm. and I started this pen pal relationship for the next few years that oh, that's fantastic where, you know I, I would talk about space stuff and he would talk about music stuff and he you know i learned a lot about <laughs> string production from him and you know i would i would just send him an email like how did you get this how did you do this string build and this i started to listen to all the other artists that he produced and um just with mm, producer's ear and and so it was really through guy's influence on imogen's music production and imogen's also imogen's production mm -hmm. that drew me back to pay attention to what she was doing because i hadn't really i wasn't you know listening to music i wasn't other than the music that i was producing i was just it was enough for me to just work at nasa and then, and make my own music so mm -hmm. i i hadn't been really listening a lot and right. then so then at one point I was asked to give a talk in Japan that the Association for Baha'i Studies in Japan asked me to invite me to Japan to give a series of public lectures about the um, history of space science and hmm. astronomy on our collective understanding of ourselves. And so at this point huh. I was living in DC. I was, I was, um, or was, maybe it was just before I had moved to D.C., but I was working at NASA, I was making music, but I wasn't really thinking in the biggest possible picture about about what what was, you know, what was the relationship between what I was doing and the history of human thought. You know, that's, <laughs> right. the, that's the biggest possible question, and I was so daunted by this invitation, right. and I felt so, you know, imposter syndrome-y about it that mm. I... I started reading and reading and studying for this for this tour because mm -hmm. I didn't even I hadn't even really even thought about the history of space science and astronomy uh, and the impact on collective human thought. So yeah, <clears throat> so, I, I, um, you immediately remind me of uh, Carolyn Porco uh, and yes. her work, the the pale blue dot, that image mm -hmm. and what it says about humanity and yeah, I mean, our I had place. been. I had been thinking a little bit at NASA because we were, you know, I was working 
and strategic planning for the agency and you know so in in some sense i had i was familiar with nasa's strategic plan which always has these really lofty things like an improved life on earth every every goal or whatever mm. ends with something lofty like that and improve quality of life for mankind or something like that but um but right. really like oh throughout all of history i didn't really know much about history and so i was reading you know in studying for this preparing for this trip i was I was reading kind of normal history of science stuff, but then I also started reading the Baha'i writings about, especially Abdul Baha's writings about um, about the history of science. And there is mm. a little bit in his writings about this. And mm -hmm. Abdul Baha, in one tablet, mentions the. So Abdul Baha is the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, and he was at, he was talking at one point about um, about the worldview. Uh, the understanding of the sun being at the center of our solar system and how that wasn't mm -hmm. always the case and how the very early Greeks actually knew this. And for example, uh, Pythagoras and, and those mm -hmm. people during that, and then it's kind of debated, but Abdul Baha said that this was known. And then mm -hmm. Ptolemy, Ptolemy proposed a different, a different idea, which was that the earth was at the center of everything. And mm -hmm. Ptolemy um, like put out, an actual written thing that started spreading and that worldview that the earth was at the center of everything then became the mm. worldview that was infused into everything. He had the and publishing advantage. <laughs> yeah. So he, pu it, because he published it and also had good arguments for mm -hmm. why it was that way. That's what took hold for the mm. next 1500 years. And it wasn't okay. until Copernicus came along and proposed Again, that the center that, that the sun was at the center, yeah. right? And so Abdul Baha actually had a tablet where he spoke about this, and I started thinking about that, like, oh wow, yeah, that's a huge misunderstanding and a mistake in knowledge that was propagated for fifteen hundred years, and it cost many people their lives in trying to right that wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was only Kepler really, and that was when I reencountered the work of Kepler because Kepler looked at at was the first person to uh, figure it out mathematically to prove Coper Copernicus's theory mathematically to really figure out the mathematics behind how the solar system works. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I didn't know, I knew that part because I was an engineering student. And of course we learned Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Right. But at that point, what I did, what I was face to face with in preparing for this talk was that Kepler figured all of that out through music and mm -hmm through a spiritual conviction that God's organizing principle was harmony. And so mm -hmm. using harmony, the spiritual principle of harmony and the, and the, the best data that existed in the moment and insisting that the observations match the, the mathematics, it was only through all of, doing all of those things together and using musical principles that he made this, that he essentially launched modern astronomy. So, mm. That was the moment where I was like, why are we not using music like this right now? Why, <laughs> why are we just playing with it like it's a toy? Why aren't we using it to understand our universe? Mm. And that was the beginning of my real, like the light going on. Like this is where, this is where the purpose is for me. This is where mm. it's like figuring out how to use music as a tool to understand ourselves and to understand the universe. And, and so that was the beginning of this um, project that so, I'm still working on. That was, that was 19 years ago. <laughs> that was 2001. And I'm still starting on this project to build, <laughs> to build a musical system that allows us to uh, learn about our, our realities. But um, yeah, that, that was right, really... So that was how did you go from that realization to, to getting uh, pulled away, away from right. NASA? Okay, and, so right. Yeah. Okay, so so that so that was two thousand one. So by by two thousand eight, I was really itching to try and figure out how to do this. How do I, how do I, how do I figure? How do I build essentially build a model of the solar system that's playable as a musical instrument where I can learn about the physics? Hmm. Um, I didn't know how to articulate it that way. I had no idea really what it was that I wanted to do, but I knew it had to do with using music as a scientific tool. Hmm. Um, and I knew that in order to do that, I was going to need to learn some new technological tools. Cause at that point, all I, I could program in Fortran 77, that was all I knew. <laughs> wow. Um, 
And that was not going to be enough to do to do what I wanted to do. Yeah, for our and kind s- listeners who who aren't <laughs> software developers, uh, Fortran is a is a rather uh, antiquated programming language that doesn't get uh, a lot of new development these days. <laughs> NASA still uses it now, but uh, but um, you know there was a lot going. This was now two thousand eight, and you know that was an explosion in 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 um, programming tools and computer mm, digital mm-hmm. tools and did, you know, yep. internet of things being born and, and that sort of thing. And I knew that I needed to figure, I needed to learn some new tools. And so I, I applied to NASA to send me to the media lab. There was a program called innovation ambassadors where they were sending people from NASA out into the world where there was innovation going on to figure out how to be innovative and bring that innovation back to NASA. Mm. So I used that as an opportunity to apply to be an innovation ambassador. And um, I went to the MIT Media Lab for a year. So this was, of course, really one of the biggest turning points of my my life and my career because I had an opportunity to just be it in this incredibly, incredibly innovative place for a whole year with no other uh, requirements of me that I then that I understand, try and understand what makes it innovative. And mm. And that was when I had time really to um to watch Imogen's video blogs and she in her video blog she was talking about how she had this studio and she but she wanted to go on tour and she wanted she needed someone to help her look after her studio and I you know I saw in the background all the equipment in her studio and it was all the same equipment that I used mm. and new including like in fact the same brand of microphone the same <laughs> software the same you know and that I had yeah. just spent the last eight years teaching myself mm-hmm. and so um I wrote to Guy at one point and um and you had already him. had an established and, relationship. and I by then I was like for three or four years Guy Guy and I had been exchanging emails so I I just wrote to him and said hey uh do you have Imogen's email address. And I, I, I wasn't planning on actually contacting her. I didn't feel ready. I hadn't done mm-hmm. anything musically that it all represented my own, I don't know, my own creativity or my own voice at mm-hmm. all. I wasn't, but, but, um, you know, I, I was also feeling embarrassed that I, mm-hmm. that I was so shy. So I decided, okay, well, I'll just get her email address. <laughs> and then at some point when I'm ready, I'll contact her. Well, mm-hmm. I wrote to guy and then the next morning when I woke up, he didn't just send me her address. He he like introduced me to her over email and she wrote back, had written back before I woke up. So <laughs> I was kind of forced into uh. into corresponding with her. And so I, I just kind of suggested, well, maybe I could help you. And you know, who who's I wasn't in the music industry. I wasn't any anybody, but right. um but she was like, Oh yeah, maybe that would be good. And she came and visited me at the media lab. And, you know, I introduced her to some of my friends that were doing really cool things she was looking for new ways to interact with her music on stage new technologies Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. one of my friends at the media lab or two of my friends had created this glove that you could you know you could grab a note while you're singing and manipulate the note and she just she saw that and she was so excited about the possibilities for her own music with Mm -hmm. a glove she was like oh that's what i need she immediately went back to the uk started working on it (laughs) <laughs> Meanwhile, I was still at the media lab and then went back to NASA for a few months. But it was really at that time that I understood that these technologies that were being developed and these tools that we have uh, in in music are actually, they're the same tools. It's, it, it's, it's like, it's kind of agnostic. Whether you want to use technology for science or use it for communications or use it for music or use it for visual arts, like the technology is the, is technology mm-hmm. and really it's just technology to enable human creativity whether that's in the sciences or in the arts or in exploration or whatever it is right. and you know it was not really very much of a leap to go from working on technology for science to technology for music it's really not a leap at all it just mm. in our world the world makes it seems like seem like it's a leap but it's not at all a leap yeah but you so mentioned very, an, yeah, yeah. You mentioned in an interview that I, I saw on, on YouTube that the pace with which things develop in the two worlds are, are dramatically different. So obviously doing government work at NASA, where, I, you know, my understanding is you, you feel lucky if you do two missions, you know, in your career uh, right. versus, yes. you know, versus yeah. the uh, the 
art world where, you know, a, an artist might say, uh, OK, we're going to build a glove and, and, and I'm going to be on stage with it in six months. You know, <laughs> go. No, it was know? one month. It was not six <laughs> months. It was, you know, it was a yeah. ridiculous amount of development in a short time with very high stakes and not uh -huh. no testing. That, mm -hmm. that was the, yeah, it was, it was a completely <laughs> different pace. Honestly, uh, I'm much better suited to that faster pace, but it certainly is nerve wracking and, and, and right. very, very, um, stress inducing. So but did she Pam pull you was, into the glove project? Is that how you ended up in her studio? Well, she got the idea for the glove project while she was visiting me. So I kind right. of pulled her Either way, it, 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 it that was where it was kind of the idea of it was born. She and Tom Mitchell started working on it uh, even before I got there. But I went soon after, not just to work on the gloves, but she was working. She was starting a new project. She was starting her Sparks album, which is essentially thirteen completely different projects. Mm. All it was like a project album. So each song is a project. It was only one song on that album that was the glove the glove song uh -huh. uh, it was called uh -huh. me the machine but for that song she wanted to completely write record and perform a song with gloves which is like whole different technology requirements for those things you know performing is one thing but creating is a whole different it's almost like a different set of requirements for that technology right and so we started we did start immediately you know she and tom had already started looking at gloves and one of the first packages to arrive at the house where I was living next door to her when I got there in 2010 was the 5DT glove that we started with, which was an off-the-shelf glove that you could buy. So we started kind of low-key at the beginning. It was only mm -hmm. one of the many projects. And since I was her musical assistant, I was her studio manager and musical assistant, I was really, really consumed 24 7 was supporting all the different projects i mean one right. project to give you an idea one project involved traveling to china for two months and setting up a, a recording studio and and completely writing and recording a song from different places in hangzhou mm. in there in china so that's just an enormous undertaking to, <laughs> to ship an entire studio's worth of gear so that imogen can write a, record and write a song in china you know so mm. the, these were not small projects we weren't just wasn't imogen just sitting in her studio creating in with you know with the tools that she right. had she was crowd right. she was one of the first people to crowdsource the first song was completely crowdsourced from from people from around the world, sounds from around the world. And oh, she, she made yeah. the first song from that, you know, and all of those were pretty ahead of their time in terms of using technology to, mm -hmm. to, to get participation from, from people. And so, you know, so at that point you're lot. working full time for, for Image and Heap. Yeah. 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 And, and what year did that transition happen? Well, I kind of, we decided to, to test things out, there was a lot of other stuff going on. My husband is British. My ex-husband, who was my husband at the time, was British, and his mother lived in England. There was some medical stuff going on. So I took some medical leave from NASA at the beginning and went to the UK to just test out whether imaging, yeah. whether that would be a fit, even mm -hmm. whether it would mm -hmm. be possible to make that that mm -hmm. leap. So there was 2010 was an experimental year, and the main project that I worked on with her during that during 2010 was a big performance at Royal Albert Hall with a crowdsourced video project uh, with an orchestra and a choir, which mm. culminated in October. And then I went back and just had to decide. Um, I went back to NASA for a few months to just make the decision, like, is this something that I'm going <laughs> to really do? And, and how did you feel about <laughs> that? I, did you Did you still feel you, like, well, that was crazy and... Or did you feel like, oh, that's definitely what I need to be doing? No, I, you know, I thought that, I mean, it was pretty obvious that it was definitely closer to my, to my purpose, but mm -hmm. I, it was also way harder to leave NASA than I thought it, than I th ever thought it was going to be. It was really, really hard for me because a lot of my identity was wrapped up in, at more than I wanted uh, to admit yeah. mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. wrapped up in being an NASA scientist and, yeah, you know, yeah. and it was a very secure job. You, if you're a civil very. servant, you're not, you're not, yeah. that's not something that you leave 
you know, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. it's a job for life, really. Um, yeah, if you- I, I worked at Goddard for a, a summer, uh, but between high school and college as an, an, an internship. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I noticed is that it's almost a, a just a standing joke with everyone. Everyone is planning to leave NASA, but never does. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's you know, I didn't expect it to be so hard. And and it it wasn't because, I don't know why. I don't know why it was so well, hard. Well, it's a but stable job and you know, it's a good salary. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, people like my friends, at Na- yeah, my friends at NASA were like, so do you have a work? contract? And and I was like, uh, no. Anything in writing? No. Do you have a insurance? No. <laughs> like no. I was basically <laughs> leaving everything stable, everything yeah. stable, and going into completely into the unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was forty-one. You know, it wasn't like I was that young. Right. Um, right. And it huh. was. It was. Um, yeah. It was not a. It was not, not a, a safe bet. No, it, there was nothing safe about it. And I'm not ever, I wasn't ever one to that I really needed a lot of safety, but this was, this was unsafe even for me. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, yeah, it yeah. was as hard as, I mean, the fear was very important and, and real. And mm-hmm. it turned out to be worth, like, it was actually everything that I was afraid of mm-hmm. was is something that happened and it was Hmm. really, really hard. So it wasn't like it was unfounded fear or it was just, it's like, there's a reason why people don't do this. It's really, Mm -hmm. really hard. (laughs) It's still hard. I'm still feeling the impact of it Mm. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah, it definitely wasn't, but that's how, that's how I got to, into, into this. So talk to me about how I understand that there's a glove project called Mimu. Is that right? Me Mew, Mew as me, in Mew. music. Okay, Me yeah. Mew. Tell us about that. Is that is that has that reached productization? Is that yeah. uh, an ongoing? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So so what we started then in 2010, then it became it started to become very clear even in those first years. 2012 was when we did the the big. She did the big performance in 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 uh, her in her garden in a big dome that she built with, that was streamed to one and a half million people with the, with the gloves. Um, that yeah. was the, that was like the very, the, that was when things were starting to develop, but we realized very early on just by the number of invitations she was getting to speak at Wired and Ted yeah. and, you know, that this was something that lots of people were going to want. And so mm-hmm. at some point we had to start transitioning our thinking from, okay, what does Imogen want and need to, what would make this a powerful tool for anyone Mm -hmm. and how do we make it affordable and accessible to anyone? Because it's not hard to make something, especially now, like the tools are, are so Mm -hmm. it's, it's really easy and possible. If you, with a little bit of effort, you can really make anything you want, but to make a product that is going to be robust enough and general enough for a wide variety of people and to make it available off the shelf Mm -hmm. is is a completely different ball of wax right and so we we it took us a long time to transition from a little project a little scrappy project team to a little scrappy startup we're still a little scrappy startup but we (laughs) but we definitely you know we've had a a pretty slick website that and you can go and you can pre-order your gloves they're still unfortunately pretty expensive because we're Mm -hmm. still right at that edge of being able to manufacture them and making them by between somewhere between making them by hand and manufacturing them the pieces now we can have manufactured but we still have to do the final assembly Assemble, by hand yeah, yeah. um hmm. and 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 really we're a hardware and a software company and so we we have we have a hardware product but we also have a piece of software that works with lots of different hardware and hmm. so we're trying to you know we're really um Every year we're getting closer to a proper company with proper uh, marketing and proper, (laughs) um, you know, management and and proper uh, everything proper. Um, But, (laughs) uh, but, uh, you know, it it has taken us 10 years to get there. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's not like a fully mass marketed thing that we can just 
like right. license out to someone or sell. And we've never wanted to be the kind of technology company for, for many, many years. Our, our business structure was as a nonprofit, which is really unusual for a tech company. So we've always just had the vision that we want to transform the way music is made rather than make money. Uh, mm-hmm. So the mm-hmm. goal has never been to create this piece of technology, build a company and then sell it, which right. is what a lot of software and hardware companies do. True. And we've been a, we've had a completely different mindset from that. Mm-hmm. We haven't even wanted to take investment from typical investment sources. So we've always been in this um, minimum kind of struggle for uh, for for funding and and mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. barely making it. Uh, but that's all in order to hold on to, I think, the the values that we collectively hold as a as a team. Right. We're still very small. Uh, but I think I think it's it's gradually now changing and more people are coming on board and we're becoming we, we, we actually had the benefit of being very widely recognized very early on before the technology and it really was ready for that kind that level of recognition. Mm-hmm, we had so mm-hmm. many people that wanted to buy gloves when Ariana took them on tour, for example. Yeah, tell us about that. What when was that and, and how did that happen? How did you that end was, up under the stage at an Ariana Grande concert? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was in 2014. We were um, building our first round of gloves that we had sold to um, a small number of, of backers that we had found in a in a Kickstarter campaign that we ran, mm-hmm. and and so we we were making. It was a very small. It was like 17 pairs of gloves that we were making, mm-hmm. and around the time when we were figuring out how to assemble all those gloves. Uh, in Imogen's barn, um, uh, <laughs> Ariana came through town, and Ariana was a big fan of of Imogen's, and she uh-huh. and so Imogen huh, invited that's her surprising. for dinner. I know, right? <laughs> no, I, I I totally get it now, but she yeah. was a really huge fan of Imogen's, and mm. so Imogen invited Ariana around to the barn or to the house for dinner. Ariana saw the gloves. Ariana really wanted a pair of gloves, and so since we were in the process of making them, we we decided to make a pair for Ariana. And so she came back around through town around Christmas time that year. Uh, and um, what's when we were in the barn, really, really working on making them happen. And she came to try them on. And when she tried it on, she decided, oh, I really want to take these on tour. But her tour was starting like two weeks later. It was so crazy. <laughs> uh, and and so we really had to scramble, first of all, to just get the gloves finished, but then also to um, figure out how to support that. How do we support her taking this experimental technology on this world tour? It was her first tour, the honeymoon tour. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was starting in earnest, I think, in, in February uh, okay. late February, but the rehearsal started literally two weeks later from mm. when she came to try them on. Right. And so, you know, all of us were working other jobs at the time. We weren't, none of us is working on Mimi full time. In fact, mm-hmm. none of us ever has worked on Mimi full time. Uh, right. this company after 10 years where nobody, mm. we've never had a full time employee. Wow. Um, and I was the only one really in a position to, be able to leave what I was doing and go help get her set up. And we had to, we had to come up with all sorts of new technologies very fast. And I, I worked with my friend Ben Bloomberg at MIT to build a system that would work on the big stage uh, with the gloves, a communication system uh, for the data. And he he was such a rock star as well. And just getting that ready in, in the matter of a week, he had put together this stage ready data transmission system. Um, Hmm. He's now, by the way, he's um, nominated as the producer of Jacob Collier's um, best record at Grammy, (laughs) best best record Grammy. Now Uh, he's just a tech tech genius. Um, and just hmm. an amazing, amazing. You'd guy, have to but... be a tech genius to to be able to contribute anything to Jacob Collier. He's right, pretty, I he's know. pretty good at the studio. No, yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've seen Jacob's um, uh, Looper work with on his Looper, but Ben built the Looper and just does oh, all of cool. his live sound. And anyway, he's. Yeah, he's... I just had seen um, Jacob Collier giving. Um, 
a, a peek into his studio and his his oh. uh, production process. He's oh, yeah. pretty savvy with Logic Pro. <laughs> Let's just oh, say, yeah. you know. Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I mean, yeah. he's he's. They're both geniuses. But yeah. anyway, Ben is yeah. a friend of mine from when I was at MIT, mm. and um, at the Media Lab, mm. and so yeah, he helped in that and getting the the system ready for Ariana, building the rack that we used, and you know, really making mm-hmm. it possible to take these on the road. But it was, it was touch and go, you know, every performance, I was a real nail biter, but, <laughs> but we never had a failure in 85 shows. We never had a failure of the technology, which oh, is fantastic. really remarkable. That is, uh, but it was, yeah, it was uh, all the nines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. So, um, how does your Mimu work relate to your, uh, professor, ship at uh university of brighton do you do you create instruments there do you many do you explore there do you experiment there or is there some are they totally separate how does that yeah work? well you know it's interesting because i i i was on tour with ariana and then that, that tour ended a, earlier than we thought it might um she just was ready to move on to other th- to other things i think and mm-hmm. um and so i was then faced with having left my what are all those stuff I was doing to make money mm-hmm. uh, in the UK? And so when I got, when the tour was ending, I was I needed to find another job, and and I applied for a couple of academic positions. I almost mm-hmm. didn't apply for uh, for this the job at uh, University of Brighton because actually the job that was posted was like a I don't know a head of a head of school job, and I wasn't really interested in running a school but right. the the dean asked me to apply anyway and then she used that that application of mine as as a way to get me in as an independent um uh, uh, adjunct professor oh, and I the see. uk adjunct professor is a different thing it really meant that i was a full professor but but part time so it allowed mm. me and she wanted me to build a fab lab essentially yeah. she wanted me to build mm-hmm. a digital fabrication lab yeah. So that um, the School of Media could get into, um, uh, well, at least in my interview, I talked about how that really spawned innovation at the at the Media Lab and how important it was for people to be able to test their ideas out and build them. And, you know, and this was at a time, this was 2015, so people were really starting to get interested in things like projection mapping and all these technology, building instruments and new instruments and controllers and you know, sensors and I don't know, all uh, technology embedded in in clothing and all of these things that the media Mm, school media wanted to get into. And, um, and so she hired me to build a lab, but as, and, and as I started getting into that, I started to find a lot of support amongst my colleagues at the university that I wasn't expecting for Mm. the Concordia project. So this, this project that had been brewing in my mind since, since, and, and it was really during the tour uh, during during my tour with Ariana and just before applying for that job at Brighton that I decided, okay, you know what? I am just going to do this. I'm going to make this the <laughs> thing, my thing. I'm going to make this an actual project. But I had no idea how to do that or even how to articulate what it was that I wanted to do. And it was starting mm-hmm. to get clearer, but I just decided that I was going to put my energies into writing grant proposals to be able to build Concordia. It didn't even have a name yet. It, the, the name Concordia didn't exist. Um, that was mm-hmm. the beginning of me getting serious about trying to figure out how to make Concordia my main thing. Mm. But it was still, it was low key in my mind until people at the university started really encouraging me to talk about it and do things. So then I started thinking, okay, well, I'm going to build this lab to have a focus on immersive media so that I could use Concordia as a flagship project for um, you know, for what's what it possible is, there, what's yeah. possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so that was really when I started, I got invited to give a talk about Concordia in one place. And once that happened, I started getting, every time I would give a talk, other people would invite me to talk about the project. So the project didn't exist yet, but <laughs> I started traveling all around the world talking about it. And it was just in speaking about it that it started to take shape. And, um, and that, you know, that was the beginning of, of where I am now, where that's really my main, my main project. I do, I am working on Mimu, but Mimu for me is a, is a piece of the larger puzzle of immersive, interactive, um, uh, data sonification, essentially a, like mm-hmm. gamified way of exploring realities, 
uh, where you're immersed in some reality that you want to understand and you explain, understand it. Yeah. Explain data sonification. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Yeah. So this is, I, I started to get it early on. I got a sense that this was part of what I needed to understand. So that was, so when I went to the media lab in 2008 was when I really started um, getting involved with the data sonification community. So if you know what data visualization is, which pretty mm-hmm, much everyone mm-hmm. know, can 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 imagine data visualized. Graphs and charts. Because and we deal with that and, all the time. Yep. And we've been doing that for hundreds of years. So really sonification is data visualization, but using sound instead of visuals. So taking any kind of uh, mathematical or physical or informational data and converting it into sound somehow Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the simplest form of this would be say taking radio waves like the rings of saturn or something and 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 converting that down into frequencies that you can hear that's the very simplest form of data sonification Um, Mm. but in our day-to-day lives for those of us who are hearing and seeing we we use what we see and what we hear together all the time our brains are wired Mm -hmm. To yeah. take whatever senses we have and integrate that all into a model of our reality around us. Perception of reality, yeah. 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 And so, but we don't yet do that with scientific data. We just take more and more screens and more and more plots <laughs> and pages and pages of squiggly lines that you have to flip back and forth to uh, understand, or like or like densely mm-hmm. packed visual displays that just are super overwhelming. At some point you can't take in any more visual data. And I think at that right. point, we actually have extra channels of perception available to us with and it's our so other much senses. more dense than than text. You know, if if you think about the spoken voice, yeah, we use that to communicate, but it's so low density compared to other information that we get uh, from our ears. Exactly. And our brains are so good at yeah. processing that sound. I mean, when you listen to music, there are like five or six different places in the brain that that music gets pumped into and parallel processed. So you process rhythm in one place of your brain, melody in another place, language in another place, harmonics mm-hmm. in another place. And the brain just, it farms it all out processes mm-hmm. all these different things in all different ways and then connects it into memory and uh you know and other other places to mm-hmm. c- to give it meaning and to like attach it to emotions and that's such right. a complex process and it happens all day every day with us and we're not even recognizing realizing it mm. um so possibly yeah. the 21st century is all about an au- au- audio <laughs> revolution whereas the 20th century was all about a visual revolution Yeah, maybe, maybe, (laughs) or just a way like, so I guess what I'm interested in is making it possible for people to use music truly, like in a a truly different way, like more like what it was in the medieval times where music was, um, instrumental and voice music was the only audible way to mimic the music of the spheres and the music of the human condition, which were two yeah. types of music that were inaudible. And if and, I recall my music history, they called it uh, musica universalis, you know, musica humana or something like that. And yes. Musica instrumentalis or something like yes, that. Yes, exactly. So, so audible music is, is a reflection of the human reality and then the deeper underlying yeah, organization cos- of yeah, the, cosmic yeah, reality of, yeah. of the physical world yeah, yeah. and so yeah. that was really it music wasn't entertainment it wasn't art in mm-hmm. fact music was one of the scientists sciences mm-hmm. it was mm-hmm. part of the quadrivium there was arithmetic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh astronomy mm-hmm. uh geometry okay and music and those yeah. four things comprised the scientific quadrivium. Those were the tools for our understanding. Mm. So mm. let's see. Um, arithmetic is number. Geometry is number in space. Astronomy was number in time. Mm. And music is, or no, music is number in time and astronomy yeah. is, is number in space and time. And mm. those, it was just four different ways of, of, of understanding number and quantifying things. Yeah. yeah quantifying mm. the world. You know, and it's so interesting what, to, yeah, I, yeah, to look at that history of, of music, the, the world we live in that you described earlier, um, where uh, music is 
commodified as a celebration of, of self essentially, or of, you know, uh, a, a persona. Um, yes. Yeah. Is and a, that is was a what transition. I was resisting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I think back to, I, I you know, I, I would point to Beethoven as the one that really insisted that it was about his personality, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> you know, and, but before that, you know, certainly, uh, um, you know, it was a gradual thing that unfolded over centuries, but it's sort of accepted that in the medieval period, particularly before the Renaissance, yeah, music was didactic. It was there to instruct. <laughs> you know, yeah, and to, yeah. And, and, and that was uh, the yeah. worldview that Kepler had. Uh, yeah. And it actually started shifting right then. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, Beethoven was a couple uh, couple hundred years after Kepler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Okay. But actually, so, box yeah. box music was was also based on the principles, the same principles as Kepler's work, mm-hmm. which people mm-hmm. don't really. How would really you describe know. that? Yeah. What What do you mean when you say that? Um, just understanding har- harmonic relationships as and harmonic progression as a mathematical expression. As as a, if you look at the mathematics of box work mm-hmm. um, and the circle of fifths and the mm-hmm. well-tempered clavier and the, the theory that underlies the work of Bach is the same harmonic theory that Kepler used to discover the way that the planets move. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, as I understand it, you know, during Bach's time, they were really wrestling with getting away from uh, the temperaments that they used at the time that were more c- closely related to the harmonic series. And they were developing temperaments that allowed you to modulate further afield from the original key. And mm-hmm. so yeah, all, all of that, that science was, was the... so related to what Bach, you know, the reason he wrote yes. <laughs> well with temper clavier is to prove that you could play in all the keys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Wonderful. So what are you doing now? Like wh- where has all of this taken you and where are you headed? Describe your, describe your creative life at the moment. You know, what are you, what are you doing? What are you up to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pandemicating. Yeah. <laughs> um, How has that affected your work? Have you um, been able to find more focus or, or less focus or how's that, how's that been treating you? I have taken a, year of rest Mm. you know Mm -hmm. i i've taken a sabbatical in a way and i've been reading and studying you know i've spent a lot of 2020 learning about myself and my brain Mm. things that i you know i was i uh learning about my my neurodivergence Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been learning about racism Mm -hmm. and systemic racism. And I've been learning about, um, community building. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, and, and, uh, I've been learning, I've, I've really, I've had an opportunity and time to just be in a, when space, this is the first time in my adult life that I've been in one place for more than three weeks. Mm. And I've been here now in my studio here for, um, for since February Mm. lockdown, and I love the lockdown, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I've just given myself permission to, uh, you know, there was a big flurry of activity on Concordia last year. Uh-huh. I, I, I had a sense that if I was going to do what I wanted to do in terms of bringing people together to, you know, s- experiment with prototyping and I was going to need to do it in 2019. I just, I just knew that intent and instinctively. Mm. I don't know why, Mm. but I knew. So I, I just quit everything and devoted 2019 to, uh, thinking about Concordia, which culminated in three month residency here in Portland with a bunch of people that I invited to think about, to think about the project and experiment and, Mm. Right. Mm. And so 2019 was a, was a really push, push, push on Concordia year. Mm. And 2020 has been really a reflect, just a time for reflecting on all of it Mm. and um, not trying to jump right in and figure out what's next immediately, just giving myself time to try and digest what I learned from 2019 (laughs) (laughs) and from my whole entire life. And also really to look at, at society and think about 
what's happening in our world right now and how um, how will Concordia address these hmm. I mean really to think at the same level of what started it all you know yeah how how could I how can I help to build a world where people can play a musical instrument and understand their oneness hmm. I've been thinking about oneness. I've been thinking a lot about oneness and how, you know, the problems in the world right now all is to essentially stem from our failure to recognize our oneness. Mm. And since Concordia really is all about uh, allowing people to experience their oneness, oneness with creation and oneness with each other and oneness with themselves and oneness with the divine, that's what Concordia is for. Mm -hmm. I know that it, there's a role for it to play, it's still very deeply unfunded. <laughs> um, and, and also um, right before the pandemic, I was, I was accepted. I was awarded a fellowship in New Zealand to come to New Zealand and build Concordia there. Oh, beautiful. And then New Zealand shut down right. and it's still shut down. So my, my visa application is in, it's a three year government impact, global impact visa. It's called, um, there's no, no direct funding associated with it, but yeah, so I'm. I've decided. I've decided that I'm going to wait till I get to New Zealand to take the next formal steps in in creating Concordia. This doesn't mm. mean I'm not thinking about it, but it's now gone back back into more of a background thinking process. I've been asked to give a couple of talks about it, so I gave a keynote address mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago uh, at the uh, audio developers conference, for example, about Concordia. So I'm still thinking about it, but I'm not, I haven't been pushing on it at all this year. Right. Um, and I've been doing some music production I'm working on. I work with Baha'i artists who set the Baha'i texts to music. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's just straight up music, music production and composition and arrangement and mixing. So I've been doing a little bit of that. But mostly I've been mostly I've been resting, trying to figure out what it means to prepare for this next phase in our collective development. Existence. Yeah. I think it's I think it's actually going to involve some pretty severe collapses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been trying to prepare for that and really like trans transform into a war, a life where I'm I'm mainly in one place. Mm. I'm so I'm cooking for myself i'm i'm you know mm -hmm. responsible for my own preparation mm -hmm. for emergencies we went through some fires some pretty intense fires that nearly mm -hmm. nearly engulfed us uh as you're probably also aware yeah. so there's been that you know 2020 has been a really interesting year it of, has of yeah stopping mm -hmm. i've just really truly really been enjoying the stopping mm. um and allowing myself to stop a little bit and reflect mm. so so in my life it's a, been a year of reflection mm. mainly well kelly it's a delight to have you thank you so much for taking time and uh speaking with us and i can't wait to see what happens when you make your way to new zealand and and, and continue working on your project <laughs> fantastic thank you thank you my pleasure thanks for inviting oh, me you're to so welcome. talk about these things <laughs> all right The 52 Sketches podcast is a product of 52 Sketches, makers of earlywords.io, daily, private, stream of consciousness writing to clear your mind and unlock your creativity. And now, music from our guest, Kelly Snook. The track is Third Nature by Imperial Mathematicians.
Ready to offer delight. Ready to offer delight. Ready to offer delight.